Hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, governments always have problems. People in power always make mistakes. There's corruption. So I don't want to. I think there's there is this kind of dichotomy. Either people romantic, romanticize the masses if it's like the most the revolution had come and it's this utopia, and others who critic like pick away every single thing. You know, I, I live in the nuance. I live in the gray, and I think that there were some serious mistakes they made. But again, you have to contextualize it and, and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and the right took advantage of things like this, um, extractivist policy. Granted, the right also wants to extra yeah. <laughs> extract resources. So, but again, they took advantage of this. They took advantage of there were fires in, in the Amazon um, leading up to the elections, and they blamed it on Ever Morales. And there was deforestation, which actually um, perpetuated. The fires would have happened anyways, but made them worse. His response was relatively quick, but the discourse was uh, of the right was, no, he didn't. I should mention that during the Anya's government, these fires got worse, and the same environmentalists who were critical of, Mace, uh, of, 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 of uh, Evo were silent about that. So, again, they capitalized on these mistakes. Um, and then another thing that I, should, that I think is very key, and, and then I would like to talk about the real reason behind the coup, which I think is racism and, and, and classism. Um, but the other, I think, two kind of, and these were probably the central um, mobilizing points for the right were Evo's decision to run for president again. Um, the Bolivian constitution permits only, the new constitution permits only two presidencies. So he, he'd served three, but the pre, he was able to serve via the other constitution. So the, according to the new one, he could only serve twice. Um, he called a referendum uh, to see if they, he could extend that or re basically remove term limits. Um, and he lost just slightly, I want to say by 0.3% or something like that. It was, you know, 49 point something to 50 point something. Um, and it, it is worth mentioning that it, it looked like he actually was going to run that referendum. And then the right created this smear campaign, said he had an illegitimate child, things that were not true. But all this kind of popped up coincidentally right before the elections. And it was kind of the, the thing that tipped it. And he lost this referendum. So the people said, we don't want you to run again. Um, he brought a case before the constitutional court here saying that it was a human right and the constitutional court decided he does have a human right to run again, that the term limits violate an individual's right to run uh, for office. Um, and that was really controversial and it is controversial. I actually, it's, it's an, an, I don't agree with the reasoning of the court. I think that the, the reasoning from like kind of a lawyer's perspective, um, I think it was a stretch. But he, he decided to run again, and, and the right said, look at him, he's a dictator, you know, he's going to look at 14 years of what he's done, he's going to stay in forever, and he's going to enslave us. Um, and then the other kind of piece that the, the right used to say, to, to basically carry out the coup is um, they said that he committed fraud during the elections. Again, I'm going to jump back to kind of the, the deeper things of what caused the coup and who these folks are, but there were elections, I, you know, I lived here the narrative of fraud, that seed was planted a year before any vote was cast. It, much like Trump did in the United States. You know, he already started with that discourse. There's going to be fraud. So it was this self, you know, when the elections came, he said, look, see exactly what I said happened. And there was all this controversy over the elections. Um, maybe we'll come back to that because I think the OAS is such a big piece, but I, I do want to get to the kind of like the, who carried out the coup and why. Um, but the OAS kind of validated these claims. All this was, uh, there wasn't really, um, I think, any real proof of fraud. I think there were multiple investigations done after by the Washington Post, the New York Times, MIT, the University of Salamanca, um, showing that there was no real kind of institutionalized fraud. But this was a narrative that they used to say, he's a dictator, he's trying to stay in forever, he's burning the Amazon, and now he's committing fraud. And, and the right used these talking points to mobilize folks who were maybe a little bit more apolitical um, and got a critical mass of people to go into the streets. Because for years, it was just kind of this small right-wing um, minority. But this did pull in much of the middle class and upper class, even folks who are liberal and, and somewhat on the left. Um, in terms of who carried out the coup, uh, it was basically right-wing Christians. Um, far right wing Christians. The person who took power after Abel was uh, Yanine Añez. She's from this small right wing party, relative, as you mentioned, 4% uh, representation. I think she was the only senator, or she got 4% of the votes. Her party previously got 4% of the votes in the 29 election, 19 elections. She was the only senator from her party. She was relatively unknown, except she was known because she tweeted out um, racist things about indigenous people. 
that uh, if you wear tennis shoes, you're not indigenous, that uh, indigenous ceremonies are satanic. Um, and so she and her, her, her allies uh, are, are very, very right wing. Um, when she took power, she, you know, raised a Bible that quite literally is bigger than her torso, you know, and her ally, this guy, Fernando Camacho, entered with a priest and who basically blessed it, you know, according to Christian tradition. Yeah, he did and like said, an exorcism, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's really is what it was and said that Pachamama will never return and that the Bible has returned to the palace. Uh, so they were open about, about their intentions um, to really pushing back on this multicultural uh, plurinationalism. Um, so really, the, the, the people who took power were almost, well, I should say, were exclusively uh, right-wing and, and Christian. Um, when Anya's took power, she only named one indigenous person to, actually, I think it was no indigenous people to her cabinet. And then when there was pushback, she named one indigenous woman as the minister of culture and tourism. And then she shut down that ministry. <laughs> so she basically put a bunch of white, ring, white right-wing Christians in power and just completely took over the government um, and really made up for lost times. I mean, there was real anger of 14 years of indigenous rule. Um, but they were able to do this because they did have the support of the liberals and some, basically the bourgeoisie. Um, I think the single most important indicator, indicators here of which side you were on was race and class. And so folks who used to have or maybe even still have left discourse or, you know, there's this very paternalistic left wing kind of Marxism here where they like the idea of Indians and Indian artwork, but they don't like the idea that an indigenous person is actually in power. They want to be the ones in power. And so when this took place, uh, the light skin, white upper class sided with the coup, even liberals. Um, and, and I'm going to dive into the weeds and I apologize, but I think it's really important to understand why this was a coup because as you mentioned, I think there, there's a debate. Uh, the right was very organized, very powerful, very strong at um, basically selling this other narrative. And a part of it is because I think they have so many connections to the international community that they were able to kind of not only sell that narrative here in Bolivia, but internationally. Um, how the coup took place was Abel Morales resigned I, on November 10th. Um, the military told him to resign. Uh, this guy Camacho, who I mentioned, he is a far right wing um, Christian zealot from the Santa Cruz region, the eastern region, which has tried to separate from Bolivia. Um, he went on television and admitted to paying the police to mutiny, admitted to negotiating with the military to force Evo's resignation. He, uh, his father was the one who actually negotiated with the military. Um, and the person he negotiated with was this guy. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm throwing out lots of names, but it's very, very relevant. Uh, what became this guy, Lopez, who became uh, um, Anya's minister of defense. And so Camacho even publicly has said that that was his reward for forcing Abel to, to, to step down. So you have first uh, right-wing leaders quite literally paying off state forces to threaten the military or threaten the president and force him to step down. In Bolivia, and again, I apologize, I'm in the weeds, only four people can be president. So when a president resigns, it goes to the vice president, then to the president of Senate and president of Congress. All four of them resigned because they received threats to their lives. Um, this guy, Victor Borda, who was the, pres the, the president of Congress, um, these kind of parastate right-wing groups, they would be the equivalent of maybe like Maybe the, the, the Oath Keeper, or is it the Oath Keepers in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, yeah. More so the Proud Boys, because uh, there's like this machismo kind of youth energy uh, to the, 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 the kind of right-wing fascist or Christian fascist elements in, in Bolivia, as far as I've seen. No, no, you're right. I mean, it, it's very bro-ish. But I will say more violent and I think more radical. And so mm. these groups kidnapped Victor Borda's brother, they tortured him. They sexually assaulted his niece. And they said, if you don't resign, we're going to kill your brother. So again, all these people in the line of secession resign under threats to their life. There is no world where that is a democratic transition. What happens in Bolivia after it goes down the line, it goes, then it reaches a point where it has to go to the assembly, to Congress, basically, um, to, to make a decision. What do we do next? Well, the right wing blocked the MAS blocked them from actually like coming together and having a quorum and deciding what to do next. And a bunch of the right wingers organized this meeting in the Catholic, the, um, the Catholic university here. And, um, 
others involved. So it was right-wing uh, candidates, um, the Catholic Church, the Brazilian ambassador, who's a far right-winger as well, um, a right-wing guy, your um, representative for the European Union. They sat in a room and they decided to name the next president. And they named Jay Nina Añez. None of these people are indigenous in the most indigenous country in the world. None of these people are elected officials. They have, it's like the equivalent of you and me deciding, I think I'm going to name Ruth now uh, president of Bolivia. Like it's, it is obviously not legitimate. Which wouldn't um, be a bad thing, but. <laughs> I mean, I, for the record, I would, I, she would definitely have my vote. But, um, you know, it's clearly not legal. Um, and they, even by their own rationale, what they did is they tried to rationalize it. And this was the discourse they used to the international community. Well, it went down the lines of secession. Since the vice, the president of Congress and Senate resigned, then it should go to the vice president of Senate or vice president of Congress. But what they did is they skipped over the Moss vice president uh, of Congress, this woman, Susana Rivero, and they, they named the second vice president. So she's like, even she's lower on the, again, it shouldn't even gone down that far on the line. It should have gone to Congress. But even by their own kind of rationale on this, it should have gone to this woman who was part of the Moss party. But they skipped her and went to Janine Añez. And they were looking for kind of a, an excuse because it looked fetch, fishy to the international community. But now you have this like rationale and said, no, this is Bolivian law. And, and so it went to Janine Añez. Um, Añez has explicitly said that Carlos Mesa, uh, this, who I'd mentioned, ran against Evo during these elections, said... We're not going to let this go to the mosque. Don't let it go to the mosque. So they've explicitly talked about it. And people involved in this said, have explicitly said how they skipped the mosque. So they named Jean Annie Añez and she took power. And um, basically, you know, I think people don't use this discourse, but it, it created a dicta dictatorship. You know, in her first week alone, she carried out two massacres. 100% um, of the people killed were indigenous Um all the people killed or injured during these two massacres were protesters. No police or military was injured or killed. They basically, people protested this coup. They went to the streets. She sent out the military. She passed a decree giving amnesty to the soldiers who, um, or immunity, sorry, to the soldiers who, do, who killed anyone. And they gunned down indigenous protesters. Um, and I was actually at one of the, the first of the two massacres in this village, Sakaba. I was there documenting the day it happened, um, was able to kind of sneak in past police. I'm shocked I was able, to, honestly, to get in. Forever will be grateful to the, uh, the local taxi driver that was able to get me there. But um, they gunned people down. They just gunned them down. And over the next year, she, you know, carried out this dictatorship. Um, and, and I think I should mention because you know you you said there's still this debate in the global north and, and even in Bolivia whether this was a coup or not. I think I went through obviously kind of the point by point. And I think there's other factors on why this was a coup, but uh, even like technical factors of like the, the, the court has to accept it. Uh, the sash was put on by the military, which is not what you do in Bolivia. So there was actual procedural things that were ignored as well. Um, but the right wing and the upper class kind of liberals have a really powerful voice here. And when the coup happened, you know, at the end of the day, an indigenous campesino farmer doesn't have the same sort of context to you know, a congressperson in the United States or even human rights institutions like Human Rights Watch. You know, it was the elite in the country that, that really served, created this other narrative. And really, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think that the most important players in the coup were more moderates, the liberals, mm -hmm. um, kind of center left folks, because they legitimized. This government was extreme. Like their discourse was extreme. Literally from the first day, they said, we're coming after you, the Moss Party, you're animals. They said that human rights people are terrorists and seditious. You know, they said journalists, they have a list of journalists that they were going to go after because they're seditious. And they did. They they went on this wild persecution spree. But when you have kind of these more temperate, tempered, like moderate folks saying, no, no, this is all legitimate. Then folks in a place like the United States say, oh, this seems pretty legitimate. And, you know, I think it's important to mention this is that the Anya's government hired a U.S. consulting firm to rebrand their image internationally. Um, this this firm, CLS Strategies, uh, is, you know, based in D.C., uh, the head of this firm, or, or at least of this, like the director of this program that that, that worked for Anya's, Mark Feierstein or Feierstein, uh, worked for Obama, is a top advisor to Biden now, and they spread all this disinformation. And CLS Strategies was the first company in the U.S. punished by Facebook for creating fake accounts, um, for spreading kind of misinformation. Um, so this is not like it almost you know when you when this was happening, it almost felt like. You were telling people, no, this is conspiracy theory, but this is all documented. They were, they were punished for doing this. 
uh, they had to disclose that they worked for the Anya's government. So the Anya's government, you know, enacted this international campaign that really cleaned their image. They had quite literally millions. The, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights found, you know, a million and a half or something um, tweets and Twitter accounts using like, it was fraud, it's not a coup, and all these spreading misinformation. So there are these two separate narratives, but one is based, and we know, I mean, we see this in the US, how big social media and memes and things like that form people's opinions. One is based on kind of facts, it was a coup. The other is based on misinformation that was a, a strategic, I mean, this was a very concrete strategy by the ruling elite that, that carried out the coup, and they were really successful. And still to this day, I mean, as you know, there's folks in the US that, that think it's not a coup. Certainly, I, I mean, I can't fathom, like I said, you know, quite literally kidnapping, even if it's a Republican. Let's say even, let's say Abel Morales was as bad as the right said. You, you know, if Trump did all these bad things, you couldn't then go down the line and start kidnapping Republicans, all Republicans and say, I'm going to kill your brother or you resign. Like that's, there's no world where that's, that's democratic. And when, when Abel resigned, dozens of MAS officials resigned because they burnt their houses, they tortured them, they sexually assaulted them. I'm the lawyer of, of a, a woman who's now a senator, but she was the mayor of, of, uh, of a town called Binto, Patricia Arce. Uh, you know, I suggest folks look up her name because there's videos online of she was kidnapped. They dragged her through the streets. They cut her hair. They dumped paint and gasoline on her. They assaulted her sexually, physically. They tortured her. And they brought her before cameras and said, denounce the MAS party. And she said, you can kill me, but I will not denounce this process of change. We will, I will continue fighting for change. And for the next year of her life, she was continually harassed by the government, by parastate groups. I mean, I, I think the beautiful thing at the end of the, the, the day, this kind of the arc to this is she was almost to the day of when she was kidnapped, one year to the day, she was voted uh, into the Senate and is now head of the Justice Commission here in Bolivia. So there, there, I'm going through all these really sad negative things, but there are these really beautiful things to celebrate. But this, they went after you know, MAS officials left and right, or those not involved in the MAS. I mean, I, they went after me. I've been attacked multiple times. I get quite literally daily death threats. And anybody who criticized the government was seen as terrorist, seditious, or MAS. MAS became like the same word as terrorism. And, and they did that for indigenous. There's, they treat indigenous as a monolith. If you're indigenous, you must be MAS. You must be a terrorist and a drug trafficker. And they went on this kind of unprecedented spree um, of human rights abuses that I've, in, at least in my time here, I've never seen. And even statistically, like in terms of political prisoners, uh, the massacres they carried out that month was the second deadliest month in Bolivia's democratic history for 40 years. Um, really, really scary times, honestly.